from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Vampire Maid by Hume Nesbitt It was the exact kind of abode that I had been looking after for weeks. For I was in that condition of mind when absolute renunciation of society was a necessity. I had become diffident of myself and wearied of my kind. A strange unrest was in my blood, a barren dearth in my brains. Familiar objects and faces had grown distasteful to me. I wanted to be alone. This is the mood which comes upon every sensitive and artistic mind. When the possessor has been overworked or living too long in one room, it is nature's hint for him to seek pastures new, a sign that a retreat has become needful. If he does not yield, he breaks down and becomes whimsical and hypochondrical as well as hypercritical. It is always a bad sign when a man becomes overcritical and censorious about his own or other people's work, for it means that he is losing the vital portions of work, freshness, and enthusiasm. Before I arrived at the dismal stage of criticism, I hastily packed up my knapsack and taking the train to Westmoreland, I began my tramp in search of solitude bracing air and romantic surroundings. Many places I came upon during the early summer wandering that appeared to have almost the required conditions, yet some pretty drawbacks prevented me from deciding. Sometimes it was a scenery that I did not take kindly to. At other places I took sudden antipathies to the landlady or landlord and felt I would rather bore them before a week was out. Other places which might have suited me I could not have as they did not want a lodger. Fate was driving me to this cottage on the moor, and no one can resist destiny. One day I found myself on a wide and pathless moor near the sea. I had slept the night before at a small hamlet, but that was already eight miles in my rear, and since I had turned my back upon it, I had not seen any signs of humanity. I was alone with a fair sky above me, a balmy ozone-filled wind blowing over the stony and heather-clad mounds, and nothing to disturb my meditations. How far the moor stretched I had no knowledge. I only knew that by keeping in a straight line I would come to the ocean cliffs, then perhaps after a trine arrive at some fishing village. I had provisions in my knapsack, and being young did not fear a night under the stars. I was inhaling the delicious summer air, and once more getting back the vigor and happiness I had lost. My city-dried brains were again becoming juicy. Thus, hour after hour slid past me, with the paces until I had covered about fifteen miles since morning, when I saw before me in the distance a solitary stone-built cottage with roughly slated roof. I'll camp there if possible, I said to myself, as I quickened my steps towards it. To one in search of a quiet, free life, nothing could have possibly been more suitable than this cottage. It stood on the edge of lofty cliffs, with its front door facing the moor and the backyard wall overlooking the ocean. The sound of the dancing waves struck upon my ears like a lullaby as I drew near. How they would thunder when the autumn gales came on and the seabirds fled shrieking to the shelter of the sedges. A small garden spread in front, surrounded by a dry stone wall just high enough for one to lean lazily upon when inclined. This garden was a flame of color scarlet predominating, with those other soft shades that cultivated poppies take on in their blooming, for this was all that the garden grew. As I approached, taking notice of this singular assortment of poppies and the orderly cleanliness of the windows, the front door opened and a woman appeared, who impressed me at once favorably as she leisurely came along the pathway to the gate, and drew it back as if to welcome me. She was of middle age, and when young must have been remarkably good-looking. She was tall and still shapely, with smooth, clear skin, regular features, and a calm expression 
that at once gave me a sensation of rest. To my inquiry, she said that she could give me both a sitting and bedroom and invited me inside to see them. As I looked at her smooth black hair and cool brown eyes, I felt that I would not be too particular about the accommodation with such a landlady. I was sure to find what I was after here. The room surpassed my expectation. Dainty white curtains and bedding with the perfume of lavender about them. A sitting room, homely yet cozy without being crowded. With a sigh of infinite relief, I flung down my knapsack and clinched the bargain. She was a widow with one daughter, whom I did not see the first day as she was unwell and confined to her room. But on the next day, she was somewhat better and then we met. The fare was simple, yet it suited me exactly to the time. Delicious milk and butter with homemade scones, fresh eggs and bacon. After a hearty tea, I went early to bed in a condition of perfect content with my quarters. Yet happy and tired out as I was, I had by no means a comfortable night. This I put down to the strange bed. I slept certainly, but my sleep was filled with dreams so that I woke late and unrefreshed. A good walk on the moor, however, restored me, and I returned with a fine appetite for breakfast. Certain conditions of mind, with aggravating circumstances, are required before even a young man can fall in love at first sight, as Shakespeare has shown in his Romeo and Juliet. In the city, where many fair faces passed me every hour, I had remained like a stoic, yet no sooner did I enter the cottage after that morning walk than I succumbed instantly before the weird charms of my landlady's daughter, Aridan Brunner. She was somewhat better this morning and able to meet me at breakfast, for we had our meals together while I was their lodger. Aridan was not beautiful in the strictly classical sense, her complexion being too lividly white and her expression too set to be quite pleasant at first sight. Yet, as her mother had informed me, she had been ill for some time, which accounted for that defect. Her features were not regular, her hair and eyes seemed too black with that strangely white skin, and her lips too red for any except the decadent harmonies of an Aubrey Beardsley. Yet my fantastic dreams of the preceding night with my morning walk had prepared me to be enthralled by this modern postal-like invalid. The loneliness of the moor, with the singing of the ocean, had gripped my heart with a wistful longing. The incongruity of those flaunting and effervescent poppy flowers, dashing their giddy tints in the face of that sober heat, touched me with a shiver as I approached the cottage. And lastly, that weird embodiment of startling contrasts completed my subjugation. She rose from her chair as her mother introduced her and smiled while she held out her hand. I clasped that soft snowflake, and as I did, so a faint thrill tingled over me and rested on my heart, stopping for the moment its beating. This contact seemed to have affected her as it did me. A clear flush, like a white flame, lighted up her face, so that it glowed as if an alabaster lamp had been lit. Her black eyes became softer and more humid as our glances crossed, and her scarlet lips grew moist. She was a living woman now, while before she had seemed half a corpse. She permitted her white slender hand to remain in mine longer than most people do at an introduction, and then she slowly withdrew, still regarding me with steadfast eyes for a second or two afterwards. Fathomless velvety eyes, these were yet before they were shifted from mine. They appeared to have absorbed all my willpower and made me her abject slave. They looked like deep, dark pools of clear water, yet they filled me with fire and deprived me of strength. I sank into my chair, almost as languidly as I had risen from my bed that morning. Yet I made a good breakfast, and although she hardly tasted anything, the strange girl rose much refreshed, and with a slight glow of color on her cheeks, which improved her so greatly that she appeared younger and almost beautiful. I had come here seeking solitude, but since I had seen Aridan, it seemed as if I had come for her only. She was not very lively, indeed, thinking back. I cannot recall any spontaneous remark of hers. She answered my questions by monosyllables and left me to lead in words, yet she was insinuating and appeared to lead my thoughts in her direction and speak to me with her eyes. I cannot describe her minutely. I only know that from the first glance and touch she gave me, I was bewitched and could think of nothing else. It was a rapid, distracting, and deflowering infatuation, 
that possessed me. All day long I followed her about like a dog. Every night I dreamed of that white glowing face, those steadfast black eyes, those moist scarlet lips. And each morning I rose more languid than I had been the day before. Sometimes I dreamt that she was kissing me with those red lips while I shivered at the contact of her silky black tresses as they covered my throat. Sometimes that we were floating in the air, her arms about me and her long hair enveloping us both like an inky cloud while I lay supine and helpless. She went with me after breakfast on that first day to the moor and before we came back I had spoken to my love and received her assent. I held her in my arms and had taken her kisses in answer to mine, nor did I think it strange that all this had happened so quickly. She was mine, but rather I was hers, without a pause. I told her it was fate that had sent me to her, for I had no doubts about my love, and she replied that I had restored her to life. Acting upon Eridan's advice, and also from a natural shyness, I did not inform her mother how quickly matters had progressed between us. Yet although we both acted as circumspectly as possible, I had no doubt Mrs. Brunnell could see how engrossed we were in each other. Lovers are not unlike ostriches in their modes of concealment. I was not afraid of asking Mrs. Brunnell for her daughter, for she already showed her partiality towards me, and had bestowed upon me some confidences regarding her own position in life, and I therefore knew that so far as social position was concerned, there could be no real objection to our marriage. They lived in this lonely spot for the sake of their health and kept no servant because they could not get any to take service so far away from other humanity. My coming had been opportune and welcome to both mother and daughter. For the sake of decorum, however, I resolved to delay my confession for a week or two and trust to some favorable opportunity of doing it discreetly. Meantime, Eridan and I passed our time in a thoroughly idle and lotus eating style. Each night, I retired to bed, meditating, starting work next day. Each morning, I rose languid from those disturbing dreams with no thought for anything outside my love. She grew stronger every day while I appeared to be taking her place as the invalid. Yet, I was more frantically in love than ever, and only happy when with her. She was my lodestar, my only joy, my life. We did not go great distances, for I like best to lie on the dry heath and watch her glowing face and intense eyes while I listened to the surging of the distant waves. It was love made me lazy, I thought, for unless a man has all he longs for beside him, he is apt to copy the domestic cat and bask in the sunshine. I had been enchanted quickly. My disenchantment came as rapidly, although it was long before the poison left my blood. One night, about a couple of weeks after my coming to the cottage, I had returned after a delicious moonlight walk with Aridan. The night was warm and the moon at the full, therefore I left my bedroom window open to let in what little air there was. I was more than usually fagged out, so that I had only strength enough to remove my boots and coat before I flung myself wearily on the coverlet and fell almost instantly asleep without tasting the nightcap draught that was constantly placed on the table and which I had always drank thirstily. I had a ghastly dream that night. I thought I saw a monster bat, with the face and tresses of Eridan, fly into the open window and fasten its white teeth and scarlet lips on my arm. I tried to beat the horror away, but could not, for I seemed chained down and thralled also with drowsy delight as the beast sucked my blood with a gruesome rapture. I looked out dreamily and saw a line of dead bodies of young men lying on the floor each with a red mark on their arms, on the same part where the vampire was then sucking me, and I remembered having seen and wondered at such a mark on my own arm for the past fortnight. In a flash I understood the reason for my strange weakness, and at the same moment a sudden prick of pain roused me from my dreamy pleasure. The vampire in her eagerness had bitten a little too deeply that night, unaware that I had not tasted the drug draught. As I woke, I saw her fully revealed by the midnight moon, with her black tresses flowing loosely and with her red lips glued to my arm. With a shriek of horror, I dashed her backward, getting one's last glimpse of her savage eyes, glowing white face and blood-stained red lips. 
Then I rushed out to the night, moved on by my fear and hatred, nor did I pause in my mad flight until I had left miles between me and that accursed cottage on the moor. The Old Portrait by Dean Elizabeth Old-fashioned frames are a hobby of mine. I am always on the prowl amongst the framers and dealers and curiosities for something quaint and unique in picture frames. I don't care much for what is inside them. For being a painter, it is my fancy to get the frames first and then paint a picture which I think suits their probable history and design. In this way, I get some curious and I think some original ideas. One day in December, about a week before Christmas, I picked up a fine but dilapidated specimen of wood carving in a shop near Soho. The gilding had been worn nearly away and three of the corners broken off. Yet, as there was one of the corners still left, I hoped to be able to repair the others from it. As for the canvas inside its frame, it was so smothered with dirt and time stains that I could only distinguish it had a very badly painted likeness of some sort, of some commonplace person, daubed in by a poor pot-boiling painter to fill the second-hand frame which his patron may have picked up cheaply as I had done after him. But as the frame was all right, I took the spoiled canvas along with it, thinking it might come in handy. For the next two days, my hands were full of work, of one kind and another, so that it was only on Christmas Eve that I found myself at liberty to examine my purchase, which had been lying with its face to the wall since I had brought it to my studio. Having nothing to do on this night, and not in the mood to go out, I got my picture and frame from the corner, and laying them upon the table with a sponge, basin of water, and some soap, I began to wash so that I might see them the better. They were in a terrible mess and I think I used the best part of a packet of soap powder and had to change the water about a dozen times before the pattern began to show up on the frame and the portrait within it asserted its awful crudeness, vile, blind, and intense vulgarity. It was a bloated piggish visage of a publican, clearly with a plentiful supply of jewelry displayed as is usual with such masterpieces, where the features are not considered of so much importance as a strict fidelity in the depicting of such articles as watch guard and seals, finger rings and breast pins, these were all there as natural and hard as reality. The frame delighted me, and the picture satisfied me that I had not cheated the dealer with my price, and I was looking at the monstrosity as the gaslight beat full upon it and wondering how the owner could be pleased with himself as thus depicted when something about the background attracted my attention. A slight marking underneath the thin coating as if the portrait had been painted over some other subject. It was not much certainly yet enough to make me rush over to my cupboard where I kept my spirits of wine and turpentine with which and a plentiful supply of rags I began to demolish the publican ruthlessly in the vague hope that I might find something worth looking at underneath. A slow process that was as well as a delicate one, so that it was close upon midnight before the gold cable rings and vermilion visage disappeared and another picture loomed up before me, then giving it the final wash over and set it in a good light on my easel while I filled and lit my pipe and then sat down to look at it. What had I liberated from that vile prison of crude paint for I did not require to set it up to know that this bungler of the brush had covered and defiled the work as far beyond his comprehension as the clouds are from the caterpillar. The bust and head of a young woman of uncertain age merged with the gloom of rich accessories painted as only a master hand can paint who is above asserting his knowledge and who has learnt to cover his technique. It was as perfect and natural in its somber yet quiet dignity as if it had come from the brush of Maloney, a face and neck perfectly colorless in their pallid whiteness, with the shadows so artfully managed that they could not be seen, and for this quality would have delighted the strong-minded Queen Bess. At first, as I looked, I saw in the center of a vague darkness a dim patch of gray gloom that drifted into the shadow. Then the grayness appeared to grow lighter as I sat from it and leaned back in my chair until the features stole out softly and became clear and definite, 
while the figure stood out from the background as if tangible, although having watched it I knew that it had been smoothly painted. An intent face, with delicate nose, well-shaped though, bloodless lips and eyes like dark caverns, without a spark of light in them. The hair loosely about the head and over cheeks, massive, silky textured, jet black and lusterless, which hid the upper portion of her brow, with the ears and fell in straight indefinite waves over the left breast, leaving the right portion of the transparent neck exposed. The dress and background were symphonies of ebony, yet full of subtle coloring and masterly feeling. A dress of rich brocaded velvet with a background that represented vast receding space, wondrously suggestive and awe-inspiring. I noticed that the pallid lips were parted slightly and showed a glimpse of the upper front teeth, which added to the intent expression of the face. A short upper lip, which curled upward with the underlip full and sensuous, or rather if color had been in it, would have been so. It was an eerie looking face that I had resurrected on this midnight hour of Christmas Eve. In its passive pallidity it looked as if the blood had been drained from the body and that I was gazing upon an open-eyed corpse. The frame also I noticed for the first time in a detail appeared to have been designed with the intention of carrying out the idea of life and death. What had before looked like scroll work of flowers and fruit were loathsome snake-like worms twined amongst charnel house bones, which they half covered in a decorative fashion, a hideous design in spite of its exquisite workmanship, that made me shudder and wish that I had left the cleaning to be done by daylight. I am not at all of a nervous temperament, and would have laughed had anyone told me that I was afraid, and yet, as I sat here alone with that portrait opposite to me, in the solitary studio away from all human contact, for none of the other studios were tenanted on this night, and the janitor had gone on his holiday, I wished that I had spent my evening in a more congenial manner, for in spite of a good fire in the stove and the brilliant gas, that intent face and those haunting eyes were exercising a strange influence upon me. I heard the clocks from the different steeples chime out the last hour of the day, one after the other, like echoes taking up the refrain and dying away in the distance, and still I sat spellbound looking at that weird picture with my neglected pipe in my hand and a strange lassitude creeping over me. It was the eyes which fixed me now with the unfathomably depth and absorbing intensity. They gave out no light but seemed to draw my soul into them and with it my life and strength as I lay inert before them. Until overpowered I lost consciousness and dreamt. I thought that the frame was still on the easel with a canvas but the woman had stepped from them and was approaching me with a floating motion, leaving behind her a vault filled with coffins. Some of them shut down while others layers stood upright and open, showing the grisly contents of their decaying and stained cerements. I could only see her head and shoulders with the somber drapery of the upper portion and the inky wealth of hair hanging round. She was with me now, that pallid face touching my face and those cold, bloodless lips glued to mine with a close, lingering kiss, while the soft black hair covered me like a cloud and thrilled me through and through with a delicious thrill that, odds it made me grow faint and intoxicated me with delight. As I breathed, she seemed to absorb it quickly into herself, giving me back nothing, getting stronger as I was becoming weaker, while the warmth of my contact passed into her and made her palpitate with vitality. And all at once the horror of approaching death seized me, and with a frantic effort I flung her from me and started up from my chair, dazed for a moment and uncertain where I was. Then consciousness returned and I looked round wildly. The gas was still blazing brightly while the fire burned ruddy in the stove. By the timepiece on the mantel I could see that it was half past twelve. The picture and frame were still on the easel, only as I looked at them the portrait had changed. A hectic flush was on the cheeks, while the eyes glittered with life and the sensuous lips were red and ripe looking with a drop of blood still upon the nether one. In a frenzy of horror I seized my scraping knife and slashed out the vampire picture. Then tearing the mutilated fragments out I crammed them into my stove and watched them frizzle with savage delight. 
I have that frame still, but I have not yet had courage to paint a suitable subject for it.